Thanks, Scotty. Awesome. Thanks, Takuya. Who loves Takuya? Awesome. Jasmine, did you put your hand up? Okay, awesome. Praise God. Thank you, brother. So cool. How you doing, everyone? Good to see you. Thanks for coming out tonight. And um, it's always good to uh, get together. And thank you, Scotty, once again. You know, Scotty's involved in everything, mate, in this church. He's like, you know, this morning he was up, you know, singing on stage. He's leading meetings tonight. He's doing church news. You know, what a champion Scotty is. So uh, I think we should give an extra special thank you. And uh, sorry? Yeah, you're single too, Michaela. So um, Scott and Michaela are sitting next to each other up there, you know. And... you know, and sometimes our vision is out there when really God had places things right here. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, so Michaela's, oh, oh, awesome. Anyway, <laughs> praise God, praise God. You know, we're just one big happy family. Uh, you know, amen, so cool. Actually, Scott, uh, I felt God speak to me uh, about you. And, uh, and he said, and, and, the name Obed Edom came to mind. And Obed Edom was a man who um, actually, it was at his place where the Ark of the Covenant stayed for a period of time uh, because um, David left it there and everything around him was blessed. And then if you look through um, in the scripture, it talks about um, you know, all the different roles in the temple and, um, and that sort of thing. Obed Edom was serving in all these different departments. He was just serving. And I felt God say that, um, like Obed Edom, you know, you're involved in so many different things in the life of this church, not just one thing, but multiple things. And God wants you to know that there's extra blessing coming your way. Uh, just like Obed Edom had the, tab, uh, had the ark at his place, and there was just like extra blessing. And I felt God say that there's blessings that you have not experienced yet that God's about to drop into your world. And part of it as a result of your heart uh, for the house of God. So bless you, mate. It's awesome. Um, <clears throat> Rochelle, how you doing? Good to see you, Rochelle, the best waitress uh, over at um, Blackboard uh, Coffee, uh, which is awesome, and uh, good to see you tonight. Uh, there's a scripture that comes to mind of me out of Proverbs. It says, the blessing of the Lord attracts wealth and he adds no sorrow to it. And I felt God say that um, your God is going to release some provision for you that you don't have to work for. Uh, you're a hard worker and you've been believing God for the provision that you need to do all the projects that God's put on your heart. But God wants you to know that as you've taken that step of faith, you're not just going to get receive some finance from what you've earned, that actually God's going to release more that you earn, didn't earn uh, into your world to do all that he's called you to do. So uh, praise God. Uh, t- Tanya, good see you. How you doing? Good to see you. And uh, I just felt uh, God say, um, and I, <clears throat> it was kind of like a little bit of the picture I was joking around uh, with those guys, but I had a, a picture of you and you were, you were looking, uh, you were wanting to resolve an issue and you were looking out here and I felt God say the answer wasn't out there, it was right here, right near you. And God's about to solve a dilemma uh, in your world that you think you needed some external source to bring into resolve and God wants you to know it's right within your reach that actually he's going to show you how you can resolve it quickly and more easily than you thought uh, before. So praise God. Um, tonight, oh, before I share as well, um, just want to um, talk to you a little bit about the internship uh, program that we're going to be doing next year. Uh, and basically uh, what this is that and people have asked me, well, what is the internship? If you want to sum it up, you could sum it up in a couple of S's. Uh, one is that it's going to be a year of study. And so what that means is that we're going to be, uh, in the future, uh, hopefully one day we might have a Bible college here again, but in the meantime, uh, our students will be doing a diploma of ministry or leadership, and it's going to be a higher ed diploma. And so we're going to, and the study will be outsourced uh, to um, the old Bible college that I used to, that I started actually uh, in Brisbane. And so it won't be just a year of doing activity, it's actually going to be a year be a year of, of study and, and it's going to be a year of transformation. Not only that, uh, it's actually going to be a year of service. And so what that means is, like, it's important to study and to learn about God, but you actually mature when you actually serve. Uh, I know a lot of people have done a lot of study, but they don't actually mature in the things of God because they don't put their hand to the plough and serve. And so not only are you signing up for a year of study, but you'll also be signing up uh, for a year of service. And not only that, there's a third S, and you're going to be signing up for a year of stretching. You know, sometimes uh, in order for us to grow, uh, God wants to stretch us. 
And it's going to be a year of stretching for those of you that sign up. And, and there'll be times where it might feel like it's, it's challenging, but it's also going to be a time where then you, you're going to look back on it and see that God has transformed your life more rapidly in that time than maybe at in any other time in your life. Uh, I ran a Bible college for a number of years, started one, and one of the things I've learned was this, that when students would go to it and they would study and then they would intern at their local church, one of the things I've noticed is that they had a rapid improvement uh, in their spiritual growth, much more than they would have had otherwise because it's a year that they've set aside to God. I know myself, my first year of Bible college is the most transformative year I ever had. It was back in 1997 before some of you were born and it was the most transforming year that I've ever had in my entire life. And so we're believing that for people here uh, that feel the call of God to go and do this, um, that you will go and do that, you'll do some stuff Study. there'll be some service but it's going to be a year of growth it's going to be a year of stretching it's going to be a year of development so if you want to know more about it this Thursday in the barista we're going to be doing an information night uh, at seven o'clock so feel free to come along and check it out um, and see if, the, if God is speaking to you uh, about it one of the things I do know is that sometimes God calls you to take a step of faith to get out of your comfort zone the Christian life is not one where everything is comfortable where everything is within your reach there are times where to stretch us, God gets us out of our comfort zone in order to step into the things that he has for us. So if you're interested, I encourage you to come and check it out. If you're not interested for next year because you might have, you might be committed to a year of study or a contract or something like that, come along anyway because you might get yourself mentally prepared uh, for the year after. So this is something that we will continue to do ongoing uh, and I believe it's going to be an incredible time uh, for people. So if you're interested in that, feel free to go and check that out. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, uh, turn with me uh, to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. I need to apologise, uh, I had organised another sermon to preach tonight, another message, and I think we might have even advertised it as well, uh, but I just felt God told me to change that message. So, uh, so I'm not going to do that message that was advertised. Uh, I'm going to do a different one uh, tonight. Uh, so sorry, Emily, I know that you went to all that work putting up those slides uh, <laughs> and that sort of thing. Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 1 says this, be imitators, be imitators of God as dearly beloved children. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I just ask and pray that you help us uh, to be all that we can be. I thank you and praise you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, uh, amen. I uh, told the morning service uh, a few weeks ago that when I was um, used to live in Sydney and when I was at Bible college to work my way through Bible college, I actually was uh, working at a Christian bookstore. It's called Word Bookstore. And so when you are involved in an industry like that, within all industries, there are certain things about it, you know, certain shop talk and, and that sort of thing that you figure find out. And one of the things that actually amazed me was the amount of people that would steal things from Christian bookstores. Uh, I remember, you know, people would steal Bibles from Christian bookstores. I remember there was one guy, he came in, he grabbed a Bible off the shelf, didn't think that we saw it. He came up to us and said, look, I bought this Bible the other day, can you please give me a refund? And he just got it off the shelf. There was another time there was a lady who brought a trolley in with all leather sides on it. And, as she, and she would have been like in her 70s. She's walking out with this trolley and now my boss thought he saw something. He stopped her, he opened it up and on the inside, there was filled with CDs um, that she was just had got off the rack and she was going to flog and she was just going to take out. It's incredible. Uh, one of the things uh, we found out was what the most stolen items in Christian bookstores around the world was. The item that was the most, um, you know, the most stolen. And the item that was the most stolen from Christian bookstores, we found out, was a thing called WWJD bracelets. And so um, back in the day, like back in the 90s, it was kind of cool to have this felt bracelet which said WWJD on it and you would walk around with it. Now, the letters WWJD um, actually stand for the words, what would Jesus do? Um, and so think about it. There's people walking around the world with this bracelet on their wrists which says, what would Jesus do? that they flog from their local Christian bookstore. And so I don't know everything that Jesus would do, but I reckon he wouldn't have done that. You know what I'm saying? And so here they are, they're walking around and stolen the WWJD bracelets. However, the concept of WWJD 
is actually uh, very good. What would Jesus do? Like in whatever situation, what would Jesus uh, do? As Christians, God wants us to actually be like him. That's why it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, be imitators of God as dearly beloved children. We are his children. And so he wants us to be imitators of him. He wants us to be Christ-like. When you become a Christian, he doesn't just give you a ticket to heaven. He actually wants to transform you and enable you to live like how he lived. He wants us to be able to model ourselves uh, on him. That means you can be as free as he was. That means you can move in power like him. We can be like Christ. That's what Christ-likeness is. And so I want to talk to you today about a few ways you can be like Christ. A few things that we should imitate, uh, imitate Christ in. And so if you're taking notes, uh, you can type or write down the left-hand side of your page uh, the, uh, the letters WWJD, uh, because every one of these points uh, starts with one of these letters. So four ways we can imitate Christ. The first way we can imitate Christ is, number one, we can imitate his walk with the Father. Mark 6.46 says, After leaving them, Jesus went on up on a mountainside to pray. There's a lot of passages of Scripture where Jesus actually would go by himself and spend time with God, and he would actually go and pray. Now, I would have thought the one person who didn't need to have a quiet time would be God and pray to God is God himself. Yes, that's exactly what, that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus would go and spend time by himself praying to the Father. How much more then should we do that as well? That if we have a consistent time praying and seeking God, that's an important part of our Christian life. You know, I'm a little bit old-fashioned, but I do believe in things such as having a regular devotional time and a regular time uh, with God. Some people say things like, oh, well, that's legalism. But no, it's not legalism. It's actually discipline. When you just have that habit, that time that you spend with him, it does great things um, actually in your life. In fact, there are times when you pray to God and spend time with him where it feels like nothing much happens, but often things can happen later as a result of just spending time with him. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. doesn't say he's the rewarder of those who spasmodically seek him. It doesn't say he's the rewarder of those who occasionally seek him. It doesn't say he's the rewarder of those whose wife prays for them. No, no, no. He's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you just diligently seek him and you just spend time with him, the Bible says that he will reward you. One of the most awesome things I love about that is that you don't even have to find him. He rewards you for looking, just for having that habit. Have you ever had spent time with Jesus and thought, I don't know where Jesus was today, but he wasn't with me? Well, he'll just reward you for looking if you have that habit. I know that we live busy lives and sometimes, you know, we've got so many things on. Sometimes we neglect that time to set aside to pray and to spend time in God's word. But really the answer to that is actually priorities. If we prioritise it, you find that you actually make the time uh, to do it. I heard about um, this time management lecturer at a university and he was trying to teach his class about the importance of time management. And so what he did was he got this great big vase and then he had, um, and he brought out a number of rocks about this big. And he said to them, how many rocks can I fit in this vase? Students said probably about four. And he said, okay, he put the first one in, second one, third one, fourth one in, came right up to the top of the vase. And then he said, how, how much more can I fit in? They said, you can't fit another thing in. He said, okay, watch this. He grabbed from behind the table a bag of pebbles. And he grabbed the pebbles and he poured them down the neck of the jar and it went around those big boulders and filled all the gaps, went up to the top. And he said, how much more can I fit in? And they said, you can't fit anything else in. He said, okay. Uh, he pulled out from behind uh, the table a bag of sand. And he grabbed the sand and he poured it down in through the, into, the, um, into the vase. And because it was much smaller than the pebbles and the boulders, it f filtered all the way through and came up to the top and completely filled uh, that vase. And then he said to the students, I've just taught you a time management lesson. Do you know what it is? They said, we don't know what it is. And he said, if you want to fit everything in life, you put the big rocks in first. The big rocks are the big priorities. 
the important things. There's always going to be lots of little things that you need to do, but there are some things that are so important that you actually have to allocate and make time for it. And I'm here to let you know, if you want to be like Christ, one of the ways we can be like him is, if, is that we can imitate his walk with the Father. The second way that we can be like Christ, the second thing we can imitate, is actually we can imitate his works of power, his works of power. Bible says in John 14 verse 12, he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Jesus said, greater works than I did, you will do. That's what he said. And what are those works that he's talking about? Well, those works he's talking about are actually his works of power. You see, we as Christians can be used by God to see the power of God touch people's lives. We can see the power of God see people healed. We can see the power of God see people delivered. We can see the power of God set free. That actually we are Christ's ambassadors. We can actually be like him. And so one of the things that, um, and one of the paradigm shifts that sometimes people have to make is that whenever you see a need or whenever you see someone who needs prayer, it's not, we don't actually have to call the pastors to go and do it. That God can actually use us to do that. Remember one time I was hiring out a boardroom at a particular hotel and when I went there, the lady, and this was in Mackay, North Queensland, the lady who was showing me around, um, she was wearing nice business attire but then I noticed she was wearing tennis shoes. And I thought to myself, you know, even for North Queensland that was a bit casual. And I said to her, so um, why are you wearing tennis shoes? And she said, oh, I just recently hurt my ankle. It's been absolutely killing me. And she said, I've, I can only put on these tennis shoes, I can't wear my business shoes. And I said, well, I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I said, if you're willing, I'm willing to pray for you. And I thought she'd say to me, get away from me, you religious freak. But she didn't. She said, okay. And I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. I said, so close your eyes. And she closed her eyes and put my hand on her shoulder. And I thought, well, you know, when, when you've got someone in that position, you should really put the gospel message in there. And I said, Lord, I, her name was Mary. I said, Lord, I thank you that you died on the cross for Mary for her sins. And, and I just ask and pray that you would heal this bad ankle. In Jesus' name, amen. Took my hand off her shoulder. She opened her eyes and she started doing this. She goes, what do you know? I'm all better. I said, really? Oh, of course. <laughs> I knew all along. Didn't have to go and call someone else. God can actually use us in demonstration of power. And the thing we need to understand is true Christ-likeness is actually demonstration of power. I grew up thinking that true Christ-likeness was being nice. I grew up thinking that true Christ-likeness was having good character. But true Christ-likeness is more than that. True Christ-likeness is actually demonstration of God's power. That's what true Christ-likeness is. Earlier this year, I told the morning service about this passage of scripture, and it's actually in three of the biblical accounts, uh, three of the gospels, and it talks about when Jesus healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And so one day, uh, Simon Peter's mother-in-law was sick, and so Peter went and he spoke to Jesus. He said, Lord, he goes, can you pray for my mother-in-law? She's not feeling too good. And he said, oh, okay, where is she? He goes in here goes into the room. He said, is that her there? Yeah, that's right. So he goes down and he said, oh, you poor darling, how are you feeling? She goes, I'm not doing too good, Jesus. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. Oh, you poor thing. Someone go make her some chicken noodle soup. Now listen here. I'll say a little prayers. He wears, he come and visit you in the morning. <laughs> that's not what happened. Bible says that Peter comes up to Jesus. Jesus, what? My mother-in-law. What about her? She's sick. Where is she? Over here, get up. Now go get me a coffee. Because the Bible says she got up and served him. True Christ-likeness isn't just being nice. True Christ-likeness is demonstration of the power and presence of God. And the awesome thing is this, God wants to use you and me. That wherever we go, whatever we do, when opportunity comes, have the courage, have the boldness to offer, your offer to pray for someone if they're sick or pray for someone if they're not well and pray for them and believe for God to touch their life. We can be imitators of Christ when it comes to his work of power. The third thing that we can be an imitator of Christ in, and now this is, um, it was difficult because, you know, when I'm writing this message, I had pre-decided that I wanted a WWJD. And so I thought, well, I need to then um, try and, you know, find a letter starting with J. 
And I thought, and then I thought it was, and the th- word that came to my mind actually wasn't an English word. It was actually a French word. Uh, and the French was uh, joie de vivre. Um, and uh, J-O-I-E-D-E-V-I-V-R-E, joie de vivre. And it actually means uh, enjoyment of life. You know, the Bible says uh, about Jesus, John 10.10, 10, he said that I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. As Christians, we should be the most joy-filled people on the planet. We should not be people who look like we've been sucking on lemons all day. We have access to the presence of God. In God's presence is fullness of joy. And we are people who can enjoy life. False religion says that all my Christian life is just suffering and I've just got to do things I don't want to do. Jesus Christ came that you might have life. He called you here to the Gold Coast so you may as well go to the beach from time to time and don't feel bad about it and don't feel guilty I understand that other people don't get to do that, but it doesn't matter. You've been blessed. You live here. You can enjoy the life that God has given you. Amen? That's why I don't want us to be too busy of a church. Some churches are so busy that the Christians don't enjoy their life. And the reality is I actually think God has called us as part of it. We serve him. We love him and there are times when we sacrifice. But I also believe that he wants us to enjoy the life that he has given given us. I mean, Jesus went to so many parties. He was actually called a wine-bibber. Imagine that. Imagine being called a wine-bibber. I don't know what it means, but it sounds terrible. (laughs) He used to hang out with sinners and he would actually go to those places he didn't actually go step into sin himself, but he was somebody who enjoyed, who enjoyed life. In the same way, us as Christians, we understand that there are times that we sacrifice. There are times when we lay things down. There are times in obedience to him we make sacrifice. But there are also plenty of times where we can thoroughly enjoy the life that God has for us. He has come that we might have life and life more abundantly. He wants us to live victoriously. He wants us to be people, enjoy what we, um, enjoy what we have. Even some of the material things in life. False religion says you can't enjoy anything uh, that is material. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy that God gives us all things for our enjoyment. And so that means we can enjoy um, the things that are in this life as well. As a Christian, if you want to be Christ-like, don't be someone who was walking around sour all the time, someone who was walking around depressed all the time. He wants us to be people who are full of life. Jesus was so different from the Pharisees who were always fault-finding, fault finding, always looking for things that people were doing wrong. But Jesus Christ was not like that. He wasn't like that at all. He was someone who released grace, and he was someone who re- released grace to other people. That's who he was. He wants us to be, and we can be like him, people who enjoy the life that he has given us. I love living here on the Gold Coast, seriously. See, sometimes I just drive around in my car, And I just say out loud, I just love this joint. It's awesome. And one of the interesting things I found just moving here is the amount of people that never go to the beach, the amount of people that never go and visit any cafes. I go to a different cafe every week. I love it. We just go check them. There's some people that don't, in, or, you know, don't go to the theme parks and that sort of thing. And just, you know, and, and some and some people even feel guilty about that sort of stuff. You don't need to feel guilty about enjoying the life of freedom and liberty that God has for us. We can enjoy, the Bible says he has come that we might have life and life more abundantly. Some Christians, their testimony is this. Before I met the Lord, I was wicked and boring. Now I've met the Lord, I'm not wicked anymore. It's still boring. God wants us to be people who enjoy. I firmly believe being a Christian is a better life than the alternative. The devil wants people to think that somehow the Christian life is worse. You can't enjoy anything or anything like that. That is an absolute lie. As a Christian, it is a better life. It's a more victorious life. It's a more freeing life. When I first became a Christian, I didn't realise that. I grew up in church my whole life and the Christians I saw around me were so boring 
that I thought, there's no way I want to be a Christian. I thought, if I've got to be like that. And I didn't become a Christian until I was 19. And when I became a Christian when I was 19, I got born again. The grass looked greener. The sky looked bluer. Everything was different. And I just thought, man, this is such a better life. I would go back to the clubs and that sort of thing that I used to go to, and it just wasn't enjoyable anymore. It had nothing on the life that God actually had uh, for me. Jesus Christ has come that you might have life and life more abundantly. And the fourth thing, the fourth thing we can imitate about God, or imitate Jesus in, is D, we can imitate his deeds of kindness. Matthew 5, 16 says this, In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Acts 10, 38 says this, Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were afflicted by the devil. doesn't say Jesus went about being good. It said he went about doing good. So what, are you a do-gooder or something? Yes, we are. (laughs) We're actually supposed to be do-gooders. We're supposed to be people who our light is able to be, that our light is shining so that we can actually call and draw people uh, unto him. That's what God has actually called us uh, to do, to be do-gooders. Everywhere we go, there's always opportunity to do good to people and it's incredible how much of a witness that is. I don't know if you've ever given a gift to someone that they felt like they didn't deserve it. It's amazing um, the reaction that you, you get or if you want to bless someone or something like that. I've had times where I've given a gift to someone and, uh, and they weren't a Christian and they're just like, they just couldn't believe it. They're like, no, I can't receive this. I can't take this or, 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 I, or I need to pay you back. And it's like, no, you don't have to pay me back. Uh, because why? Because as a Christian, deeds of kindness is what we do. A couple of years ago, I went to, uh, caught up with a whole bunch of mates of mine who I used to go to high school with. There was about eight of us. And we went to a cafe uh, in Melbourne because uh, vis- I'm from Melbourne. I was visiting there. So I went to the cafe and I was about to leave. I left before all the other guys. And uh, as I left, I felt God say, just shout the whole table, pay for the whole bill. And so, um, and I just went to the uh, restaurant, uh, you know, to, to the cashier, and I said, listen, I'll, I'll pay for the bill. And she said, just yours? I said, no, I'll pay for the whole table. So I can't remember how much it was. It might have been 200 bucks, 250 bucks, uh, something like that. Anyway, that night and the next week, the amount of texts and messages I got from those guys, they just could not believe it because they weren't Christian guys. And they just could not believe that I would do that for them. You know what some of them said to me? Next time you're in Melbourne, I'll come and hear you preach. Next time you're in Melbourne, I'll come. You let me know where you are, I'll come and hear you preach. Before that, didn't want to come and hear me preach, didn't want to go to a church. What was the thing that actually opened up their heart? It was deeds of kindness. Our deeds of kindness can separate us from the rest of the world. We are actually called to not just be good, We're actually called to do good. And God gives us opportunities wherever we go if our eyes are just open to it. I remember an even another time, um, and, and especially in the realm of generosity, like, you know, if you're, uh, you know, you might find if you have a desire to be generous to somebody, you, you'll find a lot of the time that's not, that's not your flesh wanting to do it. That's actually God. I've had a few times like that. I remember one time we're at Aldi and um, the lady in front of me, uh, you know, was, was going to pay for her, for her groceries. And, um, and I noticed that when she swiped it through, it got rejected. Credit card got rejected. And I felt God say, pay for her groceries. I'm like, no, I'm not paying for those groceries. <clears throat> and uh, and I'll and, 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 uh, get behind me, Satan. And, and, um, <clears throat> and I, had, I had 75 bucks in my pocket. And, uh, and, I, and I said, I'm not, I wouldn't put it on credit card. I've only got 75 bucks. And, and, um, and, and the lady went off to talk on her phone and the cashier looked at me and she said, look, I'm so sorry. And I said, how much were the groceries? She said, $75. <laughs> I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> Grabbed it and paid for it. We are his ambassadors. We are his representatives. Wherever we go, he wants to use us in the realm of deeds of kindness. And, you know, you can be about your thing, doing your thing. We need to understand that there are times 
where he wants us to be kind to someone. He wants us to do good to them. We are his hands and feet. You know, the Bible says that on the day of judgment, he was looking at people and he said that I was, you know, when I was hungry, he said, you didn't feed me. And he said, when I needed clothing, you didn't clothe me. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. And they said, well, where were you? They said, you know, we didn't do that to you, Lord. And he said, if you didn't do this for the least of these. So what are you saying is that every time we do that to someone, we're actually doing that on behalf of him. We are actually fulfilling what he has for our life. And I just felt God speak to me that for a number of people here, that over the next two weeks, you're going to have an opportunity to do a deed of kindness to someone. And you're going to know it's God because it's going to come from left field. It's not going to be planned. It's just going to be something that he drops in your heart. And it's like, oh, and just this random thought. And God wants you to know that when you do that, you're actually being his representative. You're being his hands and feet. You're doing that on his behalf and you'll be ministering on behalf of him. As Christians, we can be like Christ. And four of the ways that we can do that is number one is by imitating his walk with the Father. Number two, imitating his works of power. Number three, imitating his joie de vivre. And number four, imitating his deeds of kindness. And if you do that, you can be rest assured that you would be pretty Christ-like. Amen? And so I just felt here as I was preaching...